Hello and welcome to The Old Garage, number 17. I'm Wild Bill, and we have some questions from the last few episodes, a bit of silliness and a shout-out and a touch of admin, so let's get to the questions. Uh, from the Rhodes uh, special, uh, we have Craig Hagenbrook asks, Did inventors and car manufacturers play with the idea of having Caterpillar tracks being an option to early automobiles for places where the roads were rough or not maintained on a regular basis? Well, uh, it certainly was played with, uh, Caterpillar tracks in one form or another have been around since the 1830s. Uh, but as far as on cars themselves, the main issue was twofold. First of all, the car engines uh, weren't really strong enough to move tracks. Uh, so it was usually done prior to the uh, putting on cars. It would be put on large steam engines, big trucks or lorries, something like that. The other issue was, of course, uh, it also took a long time for cities and countries and states and, and principalities to get the idea of actually plowing roads for cars. Uh, and until that started happening, uh, people just simply didn't drive cars uh, in the snow. Uh, so there wasn't any push for it. And that didn't really start happening until around 1910-ish. Uh, I mean, Caterpillar tracks did get used for military vehicles, um, primarily for trucks. Uh, they were also used uh, for other types of uh, farm equipment, uh, large traction engines, etc. did uh, use them. Uh, but for cars, uh, you're not really going to see it until you, uh, of any significance until World War I. Good question, though. Okay, got a question here from uh, George's Miniature Cars. Like, love his channel, too, by the way. Check it out if you haven't yet. And uh, he said he enjoys uh, learning the history of the Henriot brothers, this is obviously from that episode, and I wonder how well it drove in the snow. Maybe tire chains were invented then. Uh, actually, tire chains were invented in 1904, and not uh, <laughs> in uh, Sweden, Switzerland, or anywhere like that. They were actually invented in uh, New York. And uh, I kind of mentioned a little bit about the fact that, you know, snow, snowy roads and cars didn't get along for a long time. And, Keep in mind that they didn't plow roads back then. What they would do instead is just press them down because if you were going to go somewhere in a, in a snowy road, you would use a horse-drawn sleigh. You wouldn't try using a car. So it was in 1904. Who was the guy? Uh, Harry, Harry uh, Weed, I believe it was, uh, who came up with the idea. Basically got it from uh, seeing folks you know, in, in muddy situations, just grabbing some twigs and sticks or ropes and things and tying them to the... Uh, tires just to help them get uh, moving along. Uh, but uh, once they finally got the idea of plowing roads, then the, the idea of tire chains and such really took off. But good question. All right, also from the uh, episode on the Henriot brothers, uh, James MacArthur, uh, he posed the following. He says, in that picture of the three-wheeler, it looks like they made the front seat out of rattan. Is that correct? He says, I would think that the weather being what it is, they might not have been the best choice. Interestingly, that all these early European cars were open top. You really had to want to go somewhere in the dead of winter. <laughs> you know what? Rattan actually made perfect sense uh, at the time because rattan is a very easy to use, very uh, versatile material for making furniture and had been for, you know, since the 18th century. Uh, it's basically you know, palm, bamboo, there's specific, you know, not bamboo specifically, but it's a type of wood that, uh, first of all, it could take the weather well. Uh, it was easy to move and deform, and it was strong. So, it, yes, rattan, you know, if you leave it outside for too long, it would definitely uh, start to deteriorate. But keep in mind, people did not, at this point in time, just leave their cars on the street. Uh, if they weren't using them, they were garaged. So, um, Having a rattan didn't, uh, didn't, wasn't a problem at all. It was very common. And also from Henry Odd uh, episode, uh, Zippy Destrange, he asked the following. He says, interesting, uh, regarding the engine, if it could run on alcohol, what kind of seals did it have? And I wonder how long it would take for alcohol to eat through brass or copper lines. Well, that particular engine was a sleeve-valved engine. 
And so therefore, it didn't have either brass or copper for its seals because it didn't have a top or a bottom cylinder head, nor did it have valves going up and down. It was a cylinder. And so the seal for the uh, combustion changer was, in fact, the cylinder steel sleeve uh, that was used very similar to what would eventually be done with the uh, Knight sleeve engine, uh, which would come later. So didn't use copper or uh, brass. It was a steel sleeved and steel uh, sealed engine. And from the episode on uh, Oldsmobile, uh, Gabriel F. asked, uh, I'd like to know a little more about tiller steered cars. Does the tiller stern all the way around like a steering wheel can or is it limited to 180 degree or so arc? Did tiller steered cars tend to have a bad turning radius? Actually, uh, uh, should be a special posted soon uh, that's going to talk a bit about the tiller steering. Uh, but here's how that works. A tiller steered car has about a 180 degree arc of movement all said and done. You know, 90 degrees left, 90 degrees right. And when you have such a small amount of movement that you can do as a driver, every small amount that you move that tiller is going to move those front wheels significantly. Now when you're traveling at 5, 10, 15 miles an hour, this is not really a problem. But once you get into 25, 30 in, in higher speeds, if you start turning the tiller and the front wheels move very quickly, you're either going to stuff the wheels into the fenders or the car's just simply going to lose traction and you're going to lose control and possibly topple. Now you will see uh, pictures of cars from that era that have something that kind of looks like a tiller, but it actually isn't. You will see a either handlebarred steering, but you'll also, which is mostly a tiller, but you'll also see what looks like a bar with a handle sticking out of it. And that actually was a primitive form of steering wheel. And so that you could spin multiple times to slow down. And many of the racing cars, you know, of 1900 and beyond had either the wheel or the bar with a handle. But they both, underneath that wheel, worked the same way. Tiller steering itself, because of its, uh, the amount of uh, movement that it gives to the uh, tires, actually had a very tight turning radius. There was no problem turning the things. Uh, it's just they would turn too fast and you just couldn't turn them at speed. So, okay, and also from the old uh, episode, uh, Craig Hagenbrook, another question. He says, uh, when did it come common for cars to have boots or trunks or glove boxes? Was this something that inventors tried or uh, a later design when the car came more of a choice of transportation when going longer distances? Um, more of the latter, uh, but there's a couple of uh, things involved with that. Uh, one being that uh, the earliest of cars only had so much power available and as much as possible had to move not only the mechanism of the car but the passengers. And so if you added, you know, four people on a car and plus built an extra piece of the body which adds more weight, fill that full of stuff, well now you're going to have a hard time getting that car even moving. So not until right around 1900 or so are you going to start seeing car bodies that actually could carry more and therefore you would have uh, you know your uh, cubby holes or glove boxes in the dash you would have a trunk or a boot in the back for or even racks for uh, strapping things to it uh, and that's going to come around 1900 and it wasn't necessarily uh, something that was you know, tried and then later that, not necessarily so. It was just, you got to wait until you have enough power to move everything. So, good question. And then, uh, from that, uh, the uh, episode on uh, First in the uh, Empire, another one from Craig, a question. He says, with the invention of early cars, how long did it take before they were used in crimes? Or car theft to start also when did chop, star, chop shops become a thing? Okay. Uh, car theft started right around 1900, <laughs> uh, and it, it's because, you know, at first when a car was somewhere, was brought to a city or a town or whatnot, it was often the very first of its kind, and so it was, it was newsworthy, and so stealing a car that, at that time, was pretty much like stealing the crown jewels, you know, everybody's going to be looking for you, so it didn't make sense. It wasn't until cars became more popular, primarily in the cities, that you started seeing car theft happening. Uh, now, the chop shop that you uh, speak of, well, that's going to be even later, because it doesn't make sense to have a chop shop, per se, 
until you have large amounts of used cars with interchangeable parts. And this didn't really start happening until after 1910. Prior to that, if you had a car that you uh, stole, but you wanted to somehow discard it, you would actually take it to a different type of machine shop, disassemble it entirely, and build something out of it using a new, using the parts that you decided to, uh, uh, you know, to reuse for your new project. So, and then another question that you get, get with this is, uh, when did designers all agree on the standard of design of a driver and passenger in front and passengers in the rear? Well, about the same time that cars got faster and more powerful because it was oftentimes you would have the driver in front and then passengers in the rear, but facing the rear. Sometimes you would have another row of seats a little lower on the front of the car uh, where people could sit, sometimes facing the driver, sometimes facing the road. And when you have a car that's only traveling at 12 miles an hour, say, because that was the national speed limit for many nations up until about 1900, then going that slow and having to look over the heads of somebody in front of you isn't too much of a hazard. But once you get to uh, cars going 25, 30 some miles an hour, you don't want to have to be, number one, looking over somebody's heads to be able to see the road. And secondly, if you were to have an accident, those people in the front would be there on scene before the accident happened by a millisecond or so. And so they wouldn't have a whole lot of protection, so they were likely going to get killed. And that's why once cars got faster, the engines also, via Panhard and Levistor, were primarily in the front. Then the bodies in the back, it just made sense. I don't think it was any kind of uh, convention, but just, you know, it just made sense to do. So uh, those were the uh, questions that we had uh, for this episode. Now, we do have some shout-out, and i got a of course, admin and a, some silliness here. Silliness! Um... Okay, I, I, a while ago, and I think my very first one, I said uh, there were a lot of makes of cars uh, from the vintage and veteran era that um, had some pretty silly names. Okay, and, and again, these are all makes of cars, okay, not brands of cars, or, or not uh, models of cars. So I thought we'd do that again, and this time I want to talk about the vintage animal cars. So these are the cars that were named after some sort of critter whether it's a real critter or like a fantasy one, like Dragon. Now, just to be sure, this is, these cars had to have actually been a production car, they had to have made at least one, and had to have been in manufacture by 1932. If 1933 and newer, I don't discuss. So like companies like Jaguar, I'm not uh, discussing. Um, the Ford Falcon, no, that Falcon was a model, not a make. And a car, a car like Horseshoe, well, it says horse in it, but a horseshoe is not a horse. It's what you nail on a horse's hoof. So uh, I'm just going to do this alphabetically because that's how I compiled everything. But here's what I found. If you know of more from the era, let me know. But uh, here we go. Various animals. First of all, from England, we have the albatross. USA, we've got the badger. In Germany, the bear. Mm. And in England, of course, the bat. Got to love bats. Now, in, uh, in USA, we got the bird and a lot of birds uh, involved. For example, the black hawk in USA, buffalo also from the USA. And speaking of birds, the chick. That's from Australia. Colt is a horse, did come from the USA. Condor in uh, Switzerland. They had one in Germany, they just spelled it with a K. Coyote, USA, has a wily uh, make there. And in the USA, another bird, crane. Now let's go to some bugs. In the USA, cricket. And, of course, also in the USA, deer. Uh, let's get to some aquatic stuff. In England, we have the dolphin, uh, the dragon, too, also uh, from the USA. Eagle in the USA, and there was an eagle in England, too. And in the uh, USA and in Germany, there was also the falcon. Back to bugs, in England, the firefly. And fox was in the USA. Gar, nice fish, out in France. Gator, Czechoslovakia. Would have figured that was in Florida or something. Greyhound in England. Uh, Griffin was in France. The Hawk in USA. And Germany gave us the herring. That just didn't seem right for some reason. Now the bug, England, uh, gives us the hornets. Uh, back to birds now. Kestrel, also uh, England. Oh boy. Leech from the USA. That name sucks. Lion in England and the USA. Mallard in France. Gotta have it. Nag. That's in Germany. 
uh, panther in France, uh, phoenix in USA, England, and Hungary, salmon uh, out of uh, England again, seal in England, some nice aquatic stuff there, silverhawk, USA, and sphinx, France, Germany, and the USA, stag in England, the starling also in England, the stork in USA, I wonder what that delivered, the swallow in England, the swan was in France, the swift in England, the tiger was from France, the wasp, more bugs, England and the USA, the wolf, those are built in England, France, and the USA, wolverines, USA, and of course, last but not least, the zebra. Okay, so those are some of the critters that you will find uh, in vintage cars. So, uh, we do have a shout out to do because uh, if you like vintage car history, I like looking at the cars uh, as well. I mean, I'll admit, I haven't done a whole lot of that yet. We'll get there once I'm uh, rich and famous. But if you want to actually see some of these cars running, see them on display uh, at the various shows and the events, etc., there's a gentleman in England who's got a great channel you've got to check out. It's called Old Classic Car. Now, he, of course, has his own cars. He has all sorts of videos about different events and rallies, goes over the cars and explains a lot about what you're seeing. And he knows his stuff. He's been doing it for decades. And if you like old classic cars, then you need to check out old classic car. So that just about wraps it up for today. Did have a touch of admin. Uh, you may have noticed on the community page recently that I finally finished the section of my channel, which was the inventors, the people that, you know, in the 19th century, the late 19th century, not quite into the turn of the century, were the folks that were the inventors. And so that's now a playlist. There's 32 episodes of it. And starting after this next special, we go into the next phase, which is going to be the innovators, which are the folks from right about the turn of the 20th century, when the automotive industry truly began to explode, and it's going to take a while, probably a year or so, just to get that section done. But hopefully you'll stick around that long. In any case, that's it for The Old Garage today, and I'll see you next time. Peace.